It's 50,000 years ago. The world is a wild, untamed expanse of ice ages and shifting seas. On a remote island shrouded in mist, far from the bustling savannas of Africa or the frozen tundras of Europe, a group of tiny beings huddle in the shadows of a vast cave. They're no taller than a modern toddler, yet they're adults, hunters, survivors, masters of a forgotten realm. These are the Hobbit people, Homo floresiensis, relics of a prehistoric puzzle that challenges everything we think we know about human evolution. What if I told you that our ancestors weren't alone, that hidden branches of humanity thrived in isolation, shrinking to fit a world of giants and dwarfs? Stick around because we're diving deep into their story, a tale of adaptation, mystery, and the raw power of nature's whims. By the end, you'll see how their world mirrors our own in ways you never imagined. Welcome to a journey back to prehistoric times, where the boundaries of humanity blur into the mists of evolution. Today, we're not just recounting facts. We're reconstructing a lost era, layer by layer, like archaeologists sifting through ancient sediments. The story of Homo floresensis isn't about a single hero or a grand quest. It's about the collective saga of a species forged in isolation, battling the elements on an island that time forgot. We'll explore their origins, their bizarre adaptations, and the enigmas that still haunt scientists today. But more than that, I'll weave in my own thoughts on what this means for us. How evolution isn't a straight ladder to supremacy, but a tangled web of survival strategies. Let's step into the prehistoric shadows of Flores Island and uncover the secrets of these ancient dwellers. To set the stage, let's transport ourselves to the Pleistocene epoch, a time when massive ice sheets locked up the oceans, lowering sea levels and exposing land bridges that allowed early humans to wander far from their African cradle. But Flores, this Indonesian island, part of the Wallacea region, was a fortress of solitude. Nestled between Asia and Australia, it was never connected by those convenient bridges during glacial maxima. The seas around it were treacherous, deep currents, sudden storms, and vast expanses of water that deterred all but the most accidental migrants. Imagine rafts of vegetation torn from distant shores by tsunamis, carrying unwitting passengers. Seeds, insects, small mammals, and perhaps one fateful day, a band of early hominins clinging for dear life. In this isolated paradise, or prison, depending on how you look at it, life took on bizarre forms. The island rule, a principle observed in evolutionary biology, kicked in with full force. Large animals cut off from mainland gene pools and facing limited resources dwindled in size. Elephants, once towering behemoths, shrank to pygmy forms no bigger than a large dog. Meanwhile, smaller creatures ballooned into giants. Rats grew to the size of rabbits, storks towered like feathered nightmares, and lizards evolved into the fearsome Komodo dragons that still prowl the islands today. This wasn't random chaos, it was nature's experiment in efficiency. With fewer predators or competitors, body sizes adjusted to match the available food and space. Energy conservation became key. Why maintain a massive frame if a smaller one suffices for survival? Into this eccentric ecosystem stepped the ancestors of Homo floresiensis. But who were they? The fossil record is sparse, like scattered bones in a vast cave. But piecing it together reveals a compelling narrative. The most plausible theory points to Homo erectus, that intrepid wanderer who left Africa around two million years ago and spread across Eurasia. Homo erectus was a success story, tall, robust, with brains up to 1,200 cubic centimeters. They mastered fire, crafted tools, and adapted to diverse environments from African plains to Asian forests. Some populations pushed eastward, reaching Java and beyond. Perhaps a small group swept by currents or deliberately venturing on primitive rafts washed ashore on Flores around one million years ago. Once there, isolation worked its magic or its curse. Over generations, the pressures of island life sculpted them into something new. Their bodies shrank. Adults stood just over a meter tall with proportions echoing earlier hominins, 
longer arms for climbing, shorter legs for navigating dense undergrowth, and feet that were disproportionately large, perhaps for stability on uneven terrain. But the real shocker? Their brains, clocking in at a mere 417 cubic centimeters, comparable to chimpanzees or the ancient Australopithecus, this was a dramatic reduction from their presumed ancestors. In prehistoric terms, this was like reverting to a toolkit from millions of years prior, while contemporaries like Neanderthals boasted brains of 1,500 cc and early Homo sapiens around 1,400 cc. Here's where my analysis comes in. This downsizing wasn't a step backward. It was a brilliant adaptation. Brains are energy hogs. Ours consume about 20% of our caloric intake despite being just 2% of body mass. On Flores, with patchy food sources and no need for complex social structures to outwit large predators or vast migrations, a smaller brain meant lower energy demands. It allowed them to thrive on less, scavenging fruits, hunting small game, and perhaps fishing in streams. Evolution doesn't aim for intelligence as an end goal. It's about fitting the niche. Think of it like modern tech downsizing gadgets for efficiency. Smaller doesn't mean inferior if it gets the job done. In fact, evidence from stone tools found alongside their bones suggests they were no slouches. These were sharp flakes and choppers used to butcher pygmy elephants whose bones bear cut marks from hobbit feasts. They weren't primitive dummies. They were optimized survivors in a miniature world. But let's delve deeper into their daily prehistoric existence. Dawn breaks over Flores' volcanic landscape, the air thick with the scent of ferns and sulfur from distant eruptions. A group of Homo floresiensis emerges from Liangbua Cave, their cool cave, a limestone sanctuary that sheltered them for millennia. No towering leaders here. The story is communal. They move in small bands, perhaps 10 to 20 individuals. Foraging through rainforests teeming with oddities, pygmy stegodons, those dwarfed elephant relatives weighing under 300 kilograms, graze nearby. With coordinated efforts, ambushes using wooden spears tipped with stone points, they bring one down, their large feet padding silently on the forest floor. Predators lurk. Komodo dragons, apex hunters, longer than three hobbits end to end, ambush from the underbrush. Giant storks, marabou-like birds standing two meters tall, compete for carrion, their wings casting shadows like prehistoric pterosaurs. And rodents? Not your garden variety. These were hefty, rabbit-sized beasts that the hobbits hunted with traps or clubs. Their diet was varied, meat from these creatures, supplemented by tubers, insects, and perhaps shellfish from nearby coasts. Fire? Likely controlled, as charred bones suggest, providing warmth in the cave's depths and a means to cook, deterring nocturnal threats. This life demanded resilience. The island's volcanoes erupted sporadically, blanketing the land in ash and altering ecosystems overnight. Tsunamis common in this seismic hotspot could wipe out coastal resources, yet they persisted for tens of thousands of years their bones layering the cave floor alongside tools and hearths. My insight here, this mirrors how prehistoric humans everywhere adapted, not through brute force, but through flexibility. Unlike the mammoth hunting clans of Ice Age Europe, the Hobbit's world was a scaled down drama where survival hinged on stealth and efficiency rather than innovation. It challenges our sapien centric view. Were they lesser humans or just differently evolved? I argue the latter. Their success in such a constrained environment proves that diversity, not uniformity, is evolution's true strength. Debates rage in scientific circles about their classification. When the first skull emerged in 2003, dubbed LB1, an adult female with a child-sized cranium, skeptics cried foul. Was this a diseased modern human? Microcephaly, Laron syndrome, even iodine deficiency were floated as explanations, but detailed analyses debunked these. The limb proportions, wrist bones resembling Australopithecus, and consistent traits across multiple individuals pointed to a distinct species. Primitive features like a robust jaw and sloped forehead harken back to early Homo, 
yet they walked upright like us. This hybrid nature fuels my commentary. Evolution isn't linear, it's a mosaic. Regressive traits? Nonsense, adaptations are context-specific. In Flora's bubble, a smaller brain sufficed for tool-making and social bonds, freeing energy for reproduction and endurance. Alternative origins intrigue me too. Some posit descent from Homo habilis, the handyman of two million years ago who might have trickled out of Africa in unrecorded waves. This would explain the archaic traits, but lacks fossil trails, no habilis bones outside Africa, or perhaps an unknown branch, a ghost lineage waiting to be unearthed. Limited digs on Flores mean we're scratching the surface. Future excavations could rewrite this story. Personally, I lean toward the Homo erectus hypothesis. It's parsimonious, fitting migration patterns evidenced by erectus fossils on nearby Java. But the uncertainty adds allure. In prehistoric studies, gaps invite imagination, reminding us that science is an evolving narrative, much like the species it describes. As we approach the twilight of their era, Let's infuse some vivid, relatable examples to ground this ancient tale. Think of modern parallels. Isolated island communities today, like the Sentinelese of the Andaman Islands, fiercely guard their seclusion, echoing how Flores' barriers shape the hobbits. Or consider the real-life story of the pygmy peoples in Africa's Congo Basin, short stature due to environmental pressures. They thrive in dense forests with adapted hunting techniques, much like our prehistoric subjects. Historically, the arrival of Europeans in Tasmania displaced indigenous groups, mirroring potential hobbit sapiens interactions. And a specific anecdote, in 2010, researchers on Flores interviewed locals about Ebu Gogo legends, hairy, diminutive forest dwellers who stole food and spoke in whispers. One elder recounted a childhood sighting in the 1950s, a small, upright figure raiding crops under moonlight, vanishing into the highlands. While unverified, it humanizes the folklore, blending myth with possible echoes of extinct kin. These stories make the hobbits feel closer, not distant fossils, but kin whose struggles resonate with our own tales of survival against odds. Extinction looms as the final chapter. Around 50,000 years ago, as Homo sapiens ventured into Southeast Asia, perhaps on boats driven by curiosity or climate, the hobbits vanished from the record. Coincidence? Maybe competition for resources edged them out or indirect impacts like introduced diseases. No evidence of violence, but volcanic cataclysms like the massive Toba eruption 74,000 years ago could have decimated populations earlier. My analysis? This underscores humanity's interconnected fate. We sapiens weren't conquerors by design. We were opportunists in a changing world. The Hobbit's end reminds me of endangered species today. Pandas in fragmented habitats or vaquitas in shrinking seas, where isolation once protected but now dooms. In wrapping up this prehistoric odyssey, the clear takeaway is this. Evolution teaches humility. The Hobbit people show us that there's no pinnacle of progress, only adaptation to the hand you're dealt. In our modern rush for bigger, smarter, faster, let's remember survival thrives on diversity and balance. Embrace your niche, conserve your energy, and adapt wisely. Who knows what isolated corners of our world, or minds, hold the next evolutionary surprise? Thanks for joining this deep dive into the past. If it sparked your curiosity, explore more, question boldly, and keep evolving.